Dr. Malathi Srinivasan with Stanford Healthcare joins us now to talk about the latest COVID-19 developments. We know some researchers have now identified six different types of COVID-19. What do those findings reveal? Sure. And Michelle, what I want to emphasize is actually not six different types of COVID, but six different symptom clusters of COVID. So uh, a study came out fairly recently looking at the outcomes of the COVID symptom study, which had taken about 1,600 people in the U.S. and the U.K. and asked them to track their symptoms. And these were people who were diagnosed with COVID. Uh, this was in March and April. And what they found was they uh, there were really six different symptom clusters from people who had just a flu-like illness with no fever uh, to people who were having abdominal and respiratory symptoms and getting shortness of breath. And so they stratified them uh, by these six different symptom clusters that had come out in their research and had looked prospectively at what happened to those people? Did they get really sick? Did they get admitted to the hospital? And what they found is uh, what they called level one, people who had sort of flu-like symptoms with no fever, you know, only about 2% of them were getting really sick. But by the time people were getting confusion or headaches with loss of smell, um, having shortness of breath and having both diarrhea and abdominal pain, um, people were having somewhere between 10 to 20% of hospital admissions. So this is a helpful I think, for people uh, in outpatient medicine uh, to be able to start thinking about uh, symptoms and categories, because we know that the virus has several phases, right? The primary infection is phase one. The second is a respiratory uh, syndrome where your lungs start to become inflamed and infected. And that's when you get the silent uh, low blood oxygen and um, people start to get very sick and you know even more fatigued. And then that third phase where your body overreacts and your immune system starts to overreact. And so this is giving us some early warning symptoms and symptom clusters to look for so that we can identify those people who might need more monitoring and who might need to come in earlier. So I think the study is very helpful, and I think it's going to be uh, useful both for doctors and for patients uh, to be able to keep track of their symptoms. Stanford Healthcare just got the green light to begin what's called pooled testing. Can you explain what that is? So Michelle, you know, in the United States, we haven't done a good job with our supply chain. And uh, as you know, we've been early on, we were running out of swabs and now we're running out of uh, what's called reagent, which is the material that we need to uh, run these COVID tests to see who has COVID and uh, who doesn't, who doesn't have the virus. And uh, because we haven't done a good job and the numbers of people in the United States are just skyrocketing about COVID. Right now, as you know, we're about four and a half million people, and we've had over 150,000 deaths from COVID. We need to be able to test people uh, repeatedly, and we need to do it in the order of millions. But the problem is that we haven't kept up with the amount of material we need uh, to be able to do that testing. So a solution to this is something called pool testing. And pool testing is where you have people who are in low risk uh, areas where there's not that many people who have uh, COVID based on uh, prior testing. And then you test them in groups. So instead of having one sample uh, um, run by itself, you take samples from anywhere between four to eight people and uh, put those samples together and you test those together. And if something comes back positive, then you test each individual one. But if not, then you would just be able to say all four of those people are negative and then you're in good shape. So uh, uh, it increases testing capacity in areas that are low prevalent. So for instance, New York City uh, has a, uh, a positive rate that's less than 2%. So they'd be able to triple their capacity. California's rate, depending on where you are, is around 5% overall. And so we might be able to increase our testing by one and a half. But if you have a low risk population of people and you need it for repeated testing for work uh, or for batch testing or for convalescent homes, um, and you can identify again, people, areas where the 
uh, uh, numbers are low, you can dramatically increase the uh, capacity and be able to decrease the wait times that we're seeing. Stanford's very lucky. We got approval uh, based on uh, a validated study uh, to make sure that this actually worked. For instance, you know, there's a lot of problems that you can run into with pool testing. You can dilute down the sample too much. Um, uh, you might not be able to detect the virus. And so we needed to make sure that the test actually worked. So um, uh, we got approval from the FDA on July 22nd, and we started pool testing. Our baseline testing capacity is about 4,500 tests per day. And uh, we think that we can hopefully double uh, that testing capacity or triple it, depending on the population who's coming in. So we're very excited about this, um, and uh, we think it's going to make a big difference. The other thing about pool testing is that it's not new. Uh, pool testing has been done for HIV and for hepatitis for quite a few years. And in fact, those were done because the reagents were so expensive and it seemed like an efficient way to be able to uh, offer more testing at lower cost to more people. So uh, applying the same technology and the same idea of taking multiple samples and putting them together for lower risk populations and then uh, retesting the samples that come out positive has been around for a while. So uh, applying this now to COVID uh, seems like a very reasonable and uh, a positive thing to do. Again, it's not uh, in every circumstance, but it has a very specific and very useful use case. Now to sports. Baseball just started again. We've already seen some players testing positive. In your professional medical opinion, is it simply too risky to continue the season any longer? Such a tough question because we all love our sports teams and I know many people will disagree with me. But I, uh, in my professional opinion, I think it is too early to open up without adequate safeguards in, in place. So what I mean by that is there's really two different sets of things we need to consider when you're reopening. The first is to make sure that you've got player and staff safety. And the second is that you can ensure the safety of the fans. And each of those requires a very different strategy. The strategy that um, the NBA and the uh, NHL have adopted, which is having a centralized bubble where you're socially isolating a group of people, has the potential to work if you can do repeated testing and if you can ensure that every single person who's interacting with those players uh, in the entire chain of uh, people who are preparing their food to um, uh, the hotels that they're staying in to all of the staff, if all of those people are doing repeated testing and they're perfectly sheltering, you might be able to create a bubble with um, uh, that can be safe. The, the problem is, is the more people you introduce into the bubble, the more likely it is that you've got a closed environment where an infection can uh, proceed very rapidly. So even then, uh, the social distancing and the um, isolation procedures that we know are effective, uh, plus the masking that we need to wear all the time uh, that we're not eating when we're around other people is important. Um, the other thing that people aren't paying attention to that needs to be very uh, carefully thought through is how to ensure proper indoor air quality and air filtration. So the filtration uh, needs to be through HEPA filters and ideally you have room air circulation on a fairly routine basis with as much clean air coming in from the outside as possible. So you want to decrease the concentration of uh, virus in an area and uh, you want to uh, try to make sure that you have good air circulation systems, uh, especially indoors. The people who seem to get COVID uh, more routinely uh, are people who are in close contact with people who are unmasked, uh, or even if who are masked, who have COVID uh, and are within about six feet of them for more than 15 minutes. So if you are in close contact with someone uh, for more than 15 minutes within six feet, uh, and that person's an asymptomatic shutter, you are at higher risk to get COVID. So when you're constructing um, uh, all of the Major League Baseball uh, or the other team activities, you have to pay attention to a lot of those dynamics. Now, uh, Major League Baseball uh, decided a couple months ago not to participate in any kind of a bubble. I think they considered a couple of them. One that was to have a, a bubble in Arizona, and then another one that was to have kind of separated bubbles in Arizona, Florida, and Texas. Uh, those now are all hotspots for COVID, and so opening up in the middle of a pandemic is very challenging. 
Um, I, I think that, uh, for instance, the Philadelphia Marlins have had over a dozen players test positive for COVID. And um, they've, of course, uh, uh, you know, shut down their team for the time being. But it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And you need, again, every single person in the chain of people who are interacting with the players to remain negative. So as much as I would love to see baseball resume and see all of our sports teams come back the way that uh, we would like them to, it uh, um, is probably not safe at this point until every single uh, measure is in place to ensure worker safety. Is there any more insight into whether COVID positive patients could catch the virus again in the future? Michelle, it's just too early to tell. And I think the countries that are offering immunity passports are doing so prematurely. Um, right now, we know that uh, people who get COVID one, if they get uh, reinfected, are probably going to have a more mild illness than they did the first time. And that's because the immune system can learn. So we make both uh, precision proteins called immunoglobulins and precision cells called T cells. Now, uh, these uh, cells will remember uh, prior infections and will get reactivated to be able to make more of those cells, to make more of the proteins and to make more of themselves to fight the infection. And there's uh, different, uh, so different viruses and different um, infections cause different degrees, are, are different viruses and infections have different degrees of being memorable by the immune system. So for instance, something like measles is very memorable. And people who get measles once usually won't get it again. But uh, little kids, for instance, who get um, a, a respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, which is a very common childhood um, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, uh, those kids can get reinfected uh, over and over again because it's not as memorable, it's more forgettable. The seasonal flu, um, uh, which is one of the coronaviruses, uh, influenza, those also are not as memorable by the immune system. But we do know that the more severe your infection the first time, uh, the more uh, memorable it's going to be for the, uh, for the body and the more uh, immune cells you'll have and the more proteins you'll have kind of circulating around just waiting to be reactivated. So we're hoping that uh, people who have COVID, when they, uh, if they get reinfected or re-exposed, that they will have a milder illness the second time. But again, we don't know yet. And there are new warnings about a growing number of potentially toxic hand sanitizers. What should consumers look out for? Yeah, who would have thought that the thing that we're doing to protect ourselves could actually be something that could hurt us? And the new news about methanol, uh, which is a toxic uh, alcohol in hand sanitizers, has really been uh, distressing for so many of us in medicine. Um, it, over the past uh, month or so, um, we've seen about a 60% spike in calls to poison centers in regards to methanol-based uh, poisoning. And uh, methanol, you know, people call it moonshine, like back from from uh, prohibition days when people were making alcohol in their own stills. Uh, that was the, if it wasn't made right, that was a toxic byproduct and it causes confusion, delirium, blindness, death um, uh, when taken orally and it can cause a milder version of those if it's just sitting on your skin. So about 18,000 people um, uh, over the, uh, in comparison with last year um, uh, and about uh, uh, 12,000 kids have had some kind of methanol poisoning recently um, and uh, so it's a big deal and it's something that we need to pay attention to. Luckily, the FDA seems like they're all over this. Um, they have a do not use list on their website. And what they've asked is, uh, and they've identified 75 brands that seem to have uh, methanol, including, and you can take a look at their site. There's, uh, I think, Blumen, um, uh, uh, one of the hand sanitizer companies, but they've asked us to look for uh, three things. One, to look at the uh, manufacturer's name, um, and then there's a national um, a data code, and uh, also uh, the sort of the manufacturing products and list of ingredients, and take a look at their website and see if any of those match uh, what's on the FDA website. So I think it's either 75 or 90 brands that they've identified as having uh, methanol in it. 
The toxicity for methanol hasn't been just from people who are just putting it on their hands, for instance. There's a, a percentage of people who are actually drinking hand sanitizer because it has alcohol in it. And when you ingest methanol, especially methanol in large quantities, it can cause, again, blindness, uh, death, um, confusion, delirium, kidney failure, and a whole host of other things. So it's a very dangerous thing to do. So uh, my two messages are this. First, uh, check the, uh, the FDA website to make sure that your hand sanitizer is safe. Um, make sure you're buying from a reputable company uh, that is a, a well-recognized brand and has quality control. And the second is do not drink hand sanitizer. And I know while that seems obvious, do not drink hand sanitizer. Dr. Malathi Srinivasan with Sanford Healthcare, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here.